Christ. I believe that he does. I believe when I say that, I don't just mean in a physical sense. I mean in a spiritual sense, in the lives of people, in the hearts and lives of uh, homes and marriages and men and women, boys and girls. I believe the Lord wants to do that. Uh, I would encourage you um, th that if the Lord has put you somewhere to serve and God has given you some place to serve, uh, do it to the best of your ability. Serve to the best of your ability. And um, we, we need folks help often. And um, this has always been a church. This has always been a church where people have just jumped in and helped wherever is needed. And um, it's, uh, it's a blessing to see the Lord uh, using that, continue to use that. And we need folks to jump in and help us. Uh, we need folks to help us in our in, in children's classes. We need folks to help us in, in bus ministry. We need folks to help us in, in all kinds of areas. And so if you have a heart to do something, you say, I want to do something for the Lord. Somebody says, well, I, 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 have some, I want to do something for the Lord. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Well, try something. <laughs> just try something. And uh, the, Lord's, the Lord's God enough. He can let you know if that's not what he wants for you or not. But uh, try something. Get involved and, and uh, plug in and uh, become attached uh, to a ministry. I think that it's, it's very important that we understand that uh, when God places us here, I was talking to someone tonight before church, and uh, when God places us here, God did not place us here in the church just to sit. The church is an opportunity for you to fulfill God's command in your life. And uh, I hope you find a place and get plugged in. And you don't miss out on what God wants to do with you. And God wants to do through you. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. If you will listen quickly, I will preach quickly tonight. All right. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 10. Look with me if you would, please. Verse number 21. And having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that is promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the, see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Oh, how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot, underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and on the holy thing and hath done despite the Spirit of grace. Well, there's some powerful words in that passage of Scripture, isn't there? I enjoy, I said this morning, I believe that God is always at work in our life. I believe that God is always working. I preached this last Sunday. I believe that God is always working to bring us to an encounter with Him. I believe God is always working in your life. And to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter how you measure up to brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or how your family and my family compare. What really matters is how do we measure up against God? How do we measure up spiritually? How do we, that's the standard that we're going to be measured by, that we're going to be judged by. And how do we, how do we measure up there? The Bible tells us here that Many oftentimes, and I said this morning, oftentimes we take for granted the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that unspeakable gift that God has given us. We often take for granted there and we, we arrive at this place in our life where we somehow believe that, that because of who we are or what we've done that we deserve better. And the truth of the matter is, is that none of us deserve what we've received. None of us deserve 
the blessing that we've been given, and certainly none of us deserve eternal life. And yet so often there are people week in and week out who come into a church service and they, they hear the gospel message or they hear a Bible message and the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you and speaks to them and, and we, we leave and never allowing the Holy Spirit to accomplish His will in our life for whatever reason. There are people who come and they hear the gospel message and they know that they're lost without Jesus Christ. They know that they, if they were to die, they would spend eternity separated from God forever. And yet they leave no different. And that is a burden. That's a burden that ought to, that's something that ought to weigh on us. That's something that we should consider. That's something that we should think of. That's something that should be on the forefronts of our mind. God, allow your Holy Spirit to work. God, allow your Spirit to speak to hearts and to change lives through every ministry of Bethel Baptist Church. Every ministry that we have, every, every thing that we operate, every, every program that we operate, it operates for one purpose. And that is getting men and women, boys and girls, to Jesus Christ. Helping them grow in the Lord to see God use their life in great and mighty way. And yet many times we often take for granted what God is doing. We often take for granted how God is working. The Bible says that we, we, no man can see God and live. The Lord doesn't walk in physically and sit down and go to church with us. We don't physically see Him, but we know when His presence is here. We know when, and we know when His presence isn't here. And if we're meeting and His presence isn't here, then there's really no reason for us to be here. Because if God's not at work, man's works are futile, man's works fail. But God's work never fails. God's, God's plan never fails. I mentioned this morning that if we were aware of the spiritual warfare that is taking place, the battle that's going on right now in this moment, for the hearts and lives of young people, for marriages, and for individuals sitting in this room, it would, it would bring great fear into our heart. We come to church and we, didn't, we, we, we sincerely should desire to see God work. We, we don't physically see the Lord, but we know when He's here, when He's not here. We shouldn't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that He's a... The Holy Spirit was sent by God. He lives in our heart, those that know Jesus Christ as Savior. He, he abides in the temple. And the Bible says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not given to the lost. It was given to the saved. It was given to the redeemed, not those that do not know Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit desires to work in our life. And yet so often we neglect and we're often disobedient. We're often... Uh, going in the opposite direction of what the Lord is desiring for our life. As I said just a moment ago, we don't physically see the presence of the Lord, but we get to go to church with each other. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? What a wonderful crowd on a Sunday evening. I'm, I'm so thankful and appreciative of folks being faithful, but I believe that God wants, God desires more, God wants more than for us to just come in and sit down with each other. Hebrews tells us, look if you would please, in Hebrews chapter number 10. He says in verse number 22, Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He said, when you come to church, he said, you, 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 you come and when you're here, he said, the first thing, the, the priority, he said, when you come to the house of God, he said, the priority is making sure our heart's right with God. And here's what I mean by that. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, confessing sin at this moment. I'm not talking about, you know, getting over an issue. I'm talking about knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. He says, a true heart. Everybody who cries, Lord, Lord, will not enter into the kingdom. 
There are many people who, who they, they know the motions, and, and I, don't under, I don't really understand. I'll pick this up because if I don't, it's going to distract me. There are many people who, who they, they, they know how to go through the motions. They know how to, how to put on the show, as I said this morning. But the sad truth is, is that there's, there's many who, who claim to know Jesus Christ as Savior that they don't have a true heart. They haven't truly been bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand something? Salvation does not come because you're a good person. Salvation does not come because you're a member of a church. Salvation does not come because you've been baptized in that baptistry over and over again. Salvation does not come because of your heritage. Salvation comes because you recognized you were lost without Jesus Christ and you placed your faith and trust in Him and you gave your life to Him. You understood that you had to repent of believing anything else was good enough and trust Him and Him alone for your eternal security. That's a true heart. Those that know Jesus Christ as Savior. He says, let us draw near. He says, let us gather with a true heart. The priority of every ministry of Bethel Baptist Church is that people know Jesus Christ as Savior. I want Danny to have a personal relationship with the Lord. I want Preston to have a personal relationship with the Lord. I want these young men to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that begins with salvation. With salvation. He says, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance and faith, having our hearts sprinkled uh, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then when he says, look what he says here, and let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. I'm so thankful. I'm going to kind of hit two things here. I'm thankful that I don't have to worry about my faith. I don't have to worry about where I'm going when I die. It's a settled matter. Amen? Amen. Doubt often robs us of, of, of many things in our life. And it robs us of, of, our, of a desire to serve and to be used because there's uncertainty in our life. But he says, Let's, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Nothing wavering. I don't have to worry about my eternity. It's settled. But I think in, 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 that's the context of Scripture. But application here. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. There are many places today where people together, gather together and, and there's no true message. There's no, there's, no, there's no truth that's settled. There's no certainty. It, it's, it's built upon men and ideas and programs and opinions. And the message changes with whoever gets to stand up behind the pulpit and preach and things often shift and, 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 and we've bought into this idea of let's just everybody love everybody and as long as we're sincere and as long as people are genuine and as long as people truly, truly believe what they're, they're saying then, then they're going to find their way to the light. What does that mean? There is a right and there is a wrong. There is a faith that is that is sure. There is a faith that we don't have to worry about wavering. But there are many people who have placed their faith in things that are not certain. They're unsettled. Circumstances, families, relationships, finances, jobs, whatever it may be. And they've settled for things that are not certain. They've placed their faith in things that aren't certain. People get up in the name of religion and they offer a, 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 a message or they offer a reason and it has nothing to do with anything that is settled. You know, the Bible says there are things that can, cannot be shaken. There are some things that can be shaken. And there are those which cannot be shaken. Friend, the Word of God cannot be shaken. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word shall last forever. He says, forever my Word is settled in heaven. The Word of God is sure. And you mark her down a hundred years from now when all of us look mighty pretty, amen? A hundred years from now, God's Word will still be sure. God's Word will still be the thing we must build upon. It'll be the thing that we must preach. It'll be the thing that it must be the focus of this ministry if it is going to be sure and steadfast and unmovable. Be sure, unwavering. Let's hold fast. Hold on to that. Let me tell you what's going to get a hold of our kids. People say, I'll get a hold of them. I was in a store this week, and I walked past a police officer who had two young men, and I use that word kindly. They were about 
14 or 15 years old, and they had obviously gotten caught for shoplifting or something. And the police officer was kindly asking them to step out of the middle of the aisle so that folks could get by. And I stood there, and I heard this young man speak in such a way to this police officer that I almost was arrested. I don't want to get a hold of them. We're not going to get a hold of them. You know what's getting a hold of these kids? Somebody get a Bible and open it up and preach the truth of God's word in love. Just because somebody gets upset, or be, uh, there's nothing wrong with being angry. I mean, you said you can't get mad, you can't yell, all this kind of good stuff. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Jesus did. If it was okay for Jesus to do, I think it's okay for us to do. Nothing wrong with being passionate and being forward about what, what is right and what is wrong. And by the way, this world is looking for something that is certain. Everything in life is shifting. Everything in life is, is often uh, uncertain except for the Word of God. The truth of God's word. He said, hold fast the profession of faith. He said, you know what's going to get hold of your young people? He said, the preaching of the word of God. You know what's going to fix marriages? The preaching and teaching of the word of God. You know what's going to solve the problems in our country? The preaching and teaching of the word of God. When God's people understand, hey, I need to hold on to the truth and not let it waver. He said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. He said, let us draw near with a true heart. And look what he says in verse number 24. And let us Consider one another. Think about this for just a moment. How many believe salvation is important? Amen. How many believe that's important? Yes. It is, isn't it? How many kids believe salvation is important? You kids believe salvation is important? Raise your hand. Very good. Believe that salvation is important. How many believe that the scriptures are important? The word of God. How many believe that's important? He said, let's hold fast the profession of our faith. What is our salvation based on? It's based upon Christ. It's based upon His finished work at Calvary. It's based upon the truth of the Scriptures. How many believe salvation is important? Say amen. amen. How many believe the Scriptures are important? Say amen. amen. And God puts that in the same line. He puts this in the same line. He said, and let us consider one another. Not only is salvation important, not only is the scripture important, he said, my servants are important. He said, let us consider one another. I said just a moment ago, we don't get to physically see God walk in and sit down and go to church with us. But God said, my servants are there with you. We have each other. And he says, and let us consider one another, get this, to provoke unto what? What is it? Love. Let us, he said, let us consider one another. To provoke unto love and to good works. God says, when we gather together, he said, you need to recognize that salvation, knowing Jesus Christ the Savior, he said, you need to understand that the Scripture has to be the foundation. He said, but I want you also to recognize it is vitally important how you treat each other. Now, we, we pastors and preachers, and I'll just go ahead and say it, many times, independent, fundamental, fire-breathing preachers, which there's nothing wrong with. Amen. I'll tell you what, many of us couldn't handle some of those old-timey sermons. We couldn't handle church back in that way, could we, Brother Ed? I mean, they didn't have padded pews. You had to come in and sit on the two-by-four if you got lucky. Amen. Preachers, they didn't, they didn't even have clocks back then. You ever heard of the day that the world stood still? That was like Sunday morning. Every Sunday. I mean, he'd preach, and he'd preach, and... When he was just about done, if he saw somebody getting a little bothered with it being long, he'd add another 20 minutes. Nothing wrong with that, but, you know, oftentimes we forget that God said that we're to provoke 
unto love. When I come to church, I ought to treat you and you ought to treat me in such a manner that it strengthens the love that we have for each other. If God's people can't love each other, how are we ever going to show the world that God loves them? He said, provoke to love. When you love something, when you genuinely love something, it'll cause you to behave and act and operate in a way that exemplifies that love. When you genuinely love something, it, you'll, you'll behave and you'll act in a way that, that says about your actions, that it, it'll cause your actions to agree with your words. Those actions will say, I love you. He said, provoke unto love and unto good works. Not forsaking the assembling yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. The day is coming, is quickly arriving, and is here, quick, it, is, it is here, where Christians are going to have to decide either I, I'm on the Lord's side, I'm on the, I'm, I'm on the side of righteousness, I'm on the side of morality, I'm on the side of things that honor the Lord. I'm on the Lord's side. You're going to have to choose either I'm going to be on the Lord's side or I'm not. And he said, when you gather together, when the people of God gather together, he said, when we get together, he said, he said you are to treat each other in a way, in a way that exemplifies those words, I love you. Provoke to love encourage to love and to good works when you love something it produces an action in your life produces an action in your life we say about our church God's blessed us God's been good to us thank the Lord for all that he's done many of us say oh I love my church well what kind of action is that producing in your life what kind of action is that Causing you. What, I, I lo words are cheap. Saying I love you and, and saying I love you about the Lord and saying I love you about God's house and God's people. What kind of action is that producing in your life? We take for granted so many times the blessings of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. He said we're to encourage, we're to motivate each other to love and to good works. Love and good works. They go hand in hand. Someone once said about giving and loving is they said that you can give without loving, but you can never love without giving. When you say, I love you, Lord, when you say, I, I love God's house, when you say, I love God's word, when you say, I love God's people, then it produces an action in your life to reveal and exemplify and to show those around you, I love you. There, there are some, they're givers. There are some, they're takers. The reason we, the reason we get that, that out of sort in our life is because we, we, don't, we don't follow Christ's example of love. He said, provoke unto love greater love hath no man than this what what's the action he laid down his life we're to love each other you know where the world gets their picture of Christ and what he can do they get it from you and they get it from me provoke unto love and to good works I want this to be a place where people are loved that sounds so <laughs> That sounds so, I don't know what the word is, but we've been trained so often. I want people to come in and see God's love. When a family gets saved or a family joins the church or a person gets right with God, let's don't take the attitude, well, let's see if it really sticks. No, no. You love them. You find great joy in what God is doing in their life. Encourage them. 
reach out to them. Get outside of your box. Get off your pew. And find somebody to love and encourage. Provoke unto good works. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for all you've blessed us with, all you've given us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for watching over us. And God, how you, you've been so good to us, we don't deserve it. Lord, I pray that you, you'd help us this evening. Lord, I thank you for your people. And God, how you've, you've brought us together. And Lord, for such a time as this, God, I pray... I pray that you'd help us to find strength to stay faithful and the courage to remain committed. Forgive us when we're not. Forgive us when we don't love in a way that honors you. Provoke unto good works. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you, God, for your care and for your concern. Help us to love the way you love. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Our heads are bowed.